thank you for, for joining us. Um, we're starting a little bit late. I apologize as this people are still joining us at those seats that you can hear of people joining us. Um, but thank you for joining us this December. I hope you've all done your Christmas shopping and you're all ready for, for Santa's arrival. Um, we have Santa with us today, in fact, all the way from the United States of America. His beard's not quite long enough, but um, he's uh, certainly got some gifts for us. Um, I'd like to welcome Michael Grinder to the stage. Thank you, Michael. Nice to be here. Nice to be here. My pleasure to uh, have so many people on the line, Toby, if they're credit to you and Kate in terms of your following. And we wanted to share with them our training that is coming up. And on the screen, you can see the dates of the 7th through the 11th of May in our famous Lockerbie, Scotland location. Toby, how far are you actually in Lockerbie itself? I am. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's where we're going to do, do this. Now, what is this all about? Instead of me sitting here and talking with you, we've prepared a segment that is about 25 minutes long, and it gives you an overview of everything we're going to cover, and it's a little more polished than if I tried to do it live. So bear with me as we watch and listen to a prepared training on what is Perception Camp and what you will learn. And again, I'll rejoin you in about 25 minutes. Definitions of what we call perception. Also, the idea of what are the benefits, because my goodness, while this is not for the faint of heart, the benefits are enormous. And then lastly, a format. What are we doing day by day and how you can understand what your activity will be and what your learning will be then? The dates are the 7th through the 11th of May, and the Toby and Kate McCartney are the sponsors. This is the hors d'oeuvre. If you like this, I promise you're going to love the main course in May. 2014. Right at the beginning of the book, we let you know why he's writing this. Page 14 and 15, it says that the first task of Blink, his work, is to convince you of a simple fact, and that is decisions can be made quickly and can be every bit as good as decisions that are made cautiously and deliberately. Sounds good. Looking forward to reading it. Answering the question in terms of when to trust and when not to trust is the second task of Blink. And when our powers of rapid cognition go weary, they go very, very weary. And yet, they usually go that way for a very specific and, and consistent set of reasons. And those reasons can be identified and understood. But here's the point I love the most. The third and most important point of why he wrote this book is to convince us that our snap judgments, our first impressions, can be educated and controlled. Oh, Malcolm, thank you for writing a book that teased everyone that they could educate their instincts and know when to trust them. It sets it up perfect for people to want to come to my course. Perception Camp, an extension of Malcolm Gladwell. Thanks, Malcolm. Now, what is Perception Camp? It literally is my attempt to design an experience where you can have my perception my first impressions that are based on 40 years and five continents of doing observation and teaching. Let me explain. Would you ask yourself five questions? First question is, what is an arena in which you're quite competent? And it can be anything. It can be at work as an office manager, a trainer in a presentation classroom. It could be quilting, cooking, gardening, 
parenting, uh, doing care for senior citizens like myself. Think of an arena in which you're quite good. Have one in mind? Then the second question is, how quickly are you able to assess a situation or a person because of all your experience? So speed in is what we're looking at. The first one, an arena in which you're very good. Number two, how fast do you use your set of skills to go ahead and assess what's going on? Number three, how accurate are you in terms of being consistently able to assess the value or competency of a person or a situation? See, what Malcolm does in his book is he uses example after example where experts actually failed. So we're asking you, how did you get to be so good? And what percentage of time are you accurate? Now, here's where number four and number five come into play and explains why we have Perception Camp. The question for you is, what did you do? What were the set of skills that you had to come up with in order to get to the speed and accuracy that you now have? And I want to suggest one of the biggest abilities that you have is that you created or were given a set of terms, vocabulary, literally, that makes you so good at what you do. Now, here's your last question. If you're in a position either now, have been in the past, or in the future will be, in which you want to mentor other people to have your sets of skills, what experiences would you set up so that they can accelerate getting to the point where they can have your speed and accuracy of perception. What is perception camp? It is a set of experiences that will allow you to accelerate your professional and speed of assessment in terms of perception. I welcome you to Scotland. And if I may, you'll be amazed at the set of experiences you're going to have that will set a foundation so that it's not just the learning while you're there for the five days. It will give you a set of experiences that will allow you to continue to learn well after the five days are over. So what is a definition of perception? Well, it's my watching reality, taking it in, mostly through our eyes, but through our ears in terms of hearing, and then the kinesthetic when you feel externally, not feel viscerally inside, but externally. So through those major senses, and we also have gustatory and olfactory, we bring in information. We then have the ability to interpret what is going on. So perception is, both bringing in from external reality and interpreting what we see. Now, what we're going to do in the camp is that we're going to suggest that there are four categories that you can consider when you're doing perception. We're going to only cover three of them. All four of them are the following. When you are looking at an individual, trying to figure out what motivates that person, when you're looking at two people interacting, who's likely to dominate, when you're looking at group dynamics, what is likely to happen next, and the fourth one, which we don't cover consciously anyhow in the training, is called system. And in system, you're always asking, what is being reinforced or being rewarded? Now, what we find is that for each of those first three categories, understanding the individual, understanding two people and understanding group dynamic, each of them have to have a separate, if you want to call it overarching question that you use as you're trying to interpret the reality that you see. For this, what we have is we have a separate book for each of the categories. When it comes to the individual, we use the book called The Elusive Obvious. The subtitle is The Science of Nonverbal Communication. And we examine how to figure out that person in terms of what motivates them 
and what uh, also the perceptual filters that they use and their belief system. This is where psychology is extremely helpful. Any understanding you have, including what's called neurolinguistic programming, transactional analysis, any degrees you have in social work or in psychology, please, you're going to use them when we're looking at an individual. And we're going to look at the person in terms of what is their appearance, how much eye contact do they make, what is their voice pattern like, is it more flat or does it roll up and down. And for the voice pattern, we're going to use the analogy of airlines. A pilot is what is called a flat voice and tends to speak with the head, holds, head still and then curl down at the end. For instance, if we were flying from Edinburgh to, say, London, hello, this is your pilot speaking. We will take about one hour and 15 minutes to arrive there. We anticipate that we're going to be on time. If there's anything we can do to help you, don't hesitate to ask. Now, after that person finishes with that kind of a voice pattern, we then have the flight attendant coming on, and the flight attendant has a very different kind of voice. The voice tends to go up and down, and it's produced because the head is bobbing. This is your flight attendants. We'll be moving up and down the aisle. We have some beverage services for this evening's flight. If there's anything we can do to help you, please don't hesitate to ask. So we're going to look at individuals. We're going to examine in terms of visual qualities, eye contact, frequency of blinking. We're going to look at voice patterns, speed, volume, flat, intonation, rolling. We're also going to be looking at kinesthetically in terms of how they stand when they shift their weight. Is their palm up, sideways, or down? We're also going to be looking at their breathing pattern. In fact, the breathing is the single most important part. We will have a whole set of worksheets that will help you identify and categorize statistically what is likely to be an individual's values, beliefs, perceptual filters. So that's our first of our three categories of perception. The second one is looking at pairs. Trying to figure out when you're looking at two people interact, who's likely to dominate we've come up with our famous, what's called cats and dogs metaphor. We've all had household pets, a dog or a cat. And by looking at people that are interacting and trying to figure out who's likely to dominate, we just use the analogy of cats tend to dominate dogs. Not it's good, it's not that it's bad, it's just that that's the way they tend to tend to operate. We have a whole set of skills to identify who the cat is and who the dog is. And what's amazing is it has nothing to do with the individual. It has the two people interacting because you can pull one person out, put them with someone else. And if they were the cat in this group, you could put them over with another pair and they might end up being the dog. So it's not about the person identity. It's a style in terms of how they operate. So that's our second of our three focuses. The pairs of people. The third category that we're going to do is probably the most complex of all of them, and it has to do with group dynamics. And the book that we use for this is called Managing Groups, The Fast Track. Now, Managing Groups, The Fast Track is a book that is 250 pages. We have a cousin to it that is called Managing Groups, The Inside Track, 500 pages. They both are exactly the same table of contents. The difference is one has twice as much information. When we are looking at a group, we're trying to figure out who is likely to be the liaison, the barometers, the outliers. And then, if you would, who are my positive leaders and who are my perhaps other than positive leaders? And how do I manage all of those at the same time? Perception camp. Four levels of perception, we're going to cover three. Each of them is going to be a, with a set of worksheets that you'll end up being able to use to help you identify. By the end of the program, your vocabulary is going to expand like crazy in terms of being able to understand 
footage of people and live situations and being able to assess them accurately. Going to see you at our next Perception Camp. Looking forward to having you there. Benefits. What will be the benefits by you attending the Perception Camp? Oh, there's many. One of the big differences is the difference between what's called the science of communication and the art of communication. In the science, we say, here are all the things you should follow. And that's basically what the first book, The Elusive Obvious, teaches us. Make sure that when you talk, have a frozen hand gesture. Make sure that you always pause and hold their attention by having the hand frozen. Those are all the, if you want to call them, rules of good communication. Perception camp goes beyond that. It goes from the science into the art. Now, what is the difference? In the art, you operate not by yes, no, always do, never do rules into what's called axioms because there's too many variables. It's too complex. So that's one of the big differences you'll walk away with in terms of the camp. But there's several others. One of them is you're going to know those four categories of perception, understanding the individual, understanding how to look at the two people, group dynamics, and then system. Each of them have their separate questions. With the individual, you're always asking what is likely to be the motivation, the belief system, the perceptual filters of that person. The, with two people, you're not trying to figure out the motivation, belief system, and perceptual filters of each party. You're trying to ask a different question. Who's likely to dominate or influence? When you're with a group, you're going to walk away with an understanding of not who's likely to dominate, not the values and beliefs and perceptual filters of all individuals present, but you're going to ask what is likely to happen next. We do not cover system in the perception camp, but the question that you ask when you're in reality is what is likely to be reinforced or rewarded by the system itself? In addition to that, you're going to also have a sense of walking away understanding when I'm hallucinating and when I'm not, which means that you're going to just be more accurate in terms of what's going on. You'll also have an, a sense of how to break the habit of almost jump into conclusions that are not evidence-based. You're going to be able to do what Malcolm Gladwell says, know when to trust and when not to trust your intuition, first impressions, immediate reaction to whatever's going on. We're also going to indicate that you're going to walk away with interpretations with higher speed and greater accuracy than you did before you started the camp. When you're out in reality and you're with someone that you want to model, what are the questions that you ask so that you're not just receiving their hallucinations, but you know what their perception is? We give you those sets of questions so that you'll be very, very good at it. Now, when you are looking at communication in reality, there's a very simple question that we talk all the time about, but we don't always know how to define it in terms of evidence base, and that is this. Two people interacting with each other. How do you know that one person is effective with the other person in a group? How do you know if someone who's either the person in charge or an individual, and is the group responding to the effect of these people communicating? We will absolutely have you walk away with a clear understanding of what is the difference between effective and ineffective communication and how to change if you recognize that you're ineffective in a given moment. Let's talk a little bit more about benefits and how to understand the advantage that you'll walk away with from attending the perception camp. This is a torso of a human being. Of course, it's an art object. And what it does is, excuse the sound as we spin it around, it shows a face inside the gut of the torso. And one of the benefits of attending the camp is that you get a sense of the difference between what's called intrapersonal, which is you with yourself, 
an interpersonal, which is outside yourself watching other people. If you mix up your intrapersonal with your interpersonal, it's a confusing and it's not reliable in terms of what goes on. Example, if you're attending a meeting and you feel inside that there's tension in the group, then you are using how you're responding to a given situation to try to understand what is actually going on. You are using your intra, how I feel, with what is objectively out in reality. Won't work. You got to separate the idea of me being in touch with myself and me understanding evidence-based what is reality. Separating those two will absolutely help you in terms of understanding reality, increase your speed of accuracy, and also have a sense of how to interpret more correctly what you see in reality. Now, how are we going to teach you this? Well, there's a concept called Y1, Y2, Y3. Let us show you what that is. What is Y1, Y2, Y3? It's a way of liberating yourself from false interpretations of reality. We have a sense in which there is reality, that's below the line, and then we have the world of interpretation above the line. If you only live below the line, you would have lots of uh, data, but you would have no meaning. If you, love, if you lived above the line, you'd have lots of interpretation, but you have no sense in terms of whether it's accurate or not. In fact, there's an expression that we use, which is this. Interpretation without evidence is dangerous, and data without interpretation is useless. So it's a balance that we have to have between the two. Let's pretend that something happens in reality. We'll call it an X. When we go up into the world of interpretation, as neurolinguistic program models of reality would indicate, we do generalizations, deletions, and distortions. How do we get more accurate so that we're not just hallucinating? Well, if you go up above the line and you say, I think this happened because, and you have a Y1. Now, if you only have one interpretation, you're stuck, you're in a rut. It's like the, you know, life seems like uh, all nails if you're just a hammer. If you end up having a Y2, a second interpretation, now you have a dilemma. You have two possibilities. When you get to the third, Y3, now you have choices. But what do you do with each of those? What you do is you have to ask yourself, if Y1 is accurate, then what would I see next in reality? If Y2 is accurate, what would I see next in reality? And of course, if Y3 is accurate, what would I see next in reality? This concept of Y1, Y2, Y3 is not theoretical. It's intended to be extremely practical. Example, let's pretend that Gail and I go to a party and we're driving home. We're talking to each other. And we say, wasn't Aunt Helenella really, really in denial? And Gail says, denial? I thought she was in grief. Now we have two interpretations of the same behavior. We could describe the behavior. She seemed maudlin. She was crying a little bit. Uh, she was quite emotional. Uh, she didn't listen well to other people. We can agree below the line, but we have two different interpretations above the line. What do you do? If it's appropriate, and this is true for all skills and techniques, the timing with permission has to be present. If the two of you, each with your own possessive interpretation, can say, what would be a possible third interpretation of that? And if you can come up with it, now it's no longer possessive, mine versus yours. It's three possibilities, which one might be appropriate. Then you ask yourself, if she was in denial, what would we see? If she was grieving, what would we see? And then you have to have the third interpretation. Oh, it could be hilarious, such as maybe she was holding in gas. Who knows? So knowing that that's true, 
the practicalness of Y1, Y2, Y3 is it allows you to not fight above the line, but understand below the line what would happen next. Now, here's what's amazing. If your interpretation and another interpretation and the third, if they have the same behavior below the line, you're just making up nominalizations above the line. Example, a mug, and I could call this a pen. They're just words. So anytime above the line, there's sets of words that people are possessive with, especially if they've been trained in different models, I tend to concede and let them use whatever words they want. I'm more interested in below the line. The other thing that is true is if you do have three interpretations above the line and they actually have different behaviors that you'd look for below the line, then whichever model can predict what is likely to happen most of the time, that's a superior model. And so predictability determines the usefulness of abstractions. Now, one more possibility. If there is no possibility to understand below the line, what would happen next? Then you have what's called circular thinking. That's why we go to university and get all those degrees. They're not quite reality. So if I may, circular thinking is enjoy the academic exercise because there's nothing you can do to verify below the line what would happen next. Why one? Why two? Why three? Practical user. One final benefit, if you want to call it that, in terms of why you want to attend this camp. Your reality that you are living in now, when you finish the camp, is going to be exactly the same reality. But you'll look at it differently. Example, here is a picture of a person who's carving himself out. And of course, that's one of our themes, is that your personal ambition will make a huge difference in terms of what you walk away with from the camp. But let's look at this as if we're not looking at the content, but the process involved. So let's pretend this is your reality. This is the reality you had before you came to camp. And what is it going to be when you finish with the camp? It's the same reality. But this frame, in terms of how you look at it, is going to be extremely different. Example, you might have the same reality, but you may view it differently based on what you learn at the camp. And instead of giving you just one new way of looking at it, we're going to give you a variety of ways of looking at it. Each of these frames has you look at a different set of colors inside the reality. Reality hasn't changed, but you see it differently. So you will walk away from the camp with the same reality that you left and you're going to go back to, but you're sure going to see it differently. We're going to give you choices on how you look at reality. See you at the camp. Last area we want to cover is the format. What's the day-to-day -day operation going to be like? Well, you're going to do a lot of learning in groups. And what you're going to do is you get to bring three minutes of footage of anything you're interested in. It can be about an individual. It can be about two people. It can be about a group. It can be from your family, from your business. It could be you presenting in front of a group. It could be from a movie, a TV show. Some of my favorites that we see on a regular basis is Guarding Tess. Oof, what a great movie about cats. We'll also go back and even black and white things. You show you clips from like the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Why? It shows you about not blinking and the effect it, it has on an audience when you keep your eyes open the whole time you're talking. Ooh, we got to talk about this one. This is one of the best. Ooh, Aaron Brockovich. Of course, we had to delete a lot of it because it was cussing in it. So it's a really quite short piece that we'll be showing you. We are going to um, do some really important considerations called discipline, um, management, charisma. And one of the shows we're going to, one of the aspects we're going to show you is a clip from the movie Saving Private Ryan.
The other one that is a very, very excellent display of how do you breathe when you're doing a very difficult conversation, and it's going to be called the movie Family Stone. And of course, nothing would be complete in terms of talking about the use of nonverbals without going into the famous movie Pretty Woman. Now, you will be bringing your three minutes of anything you want. You can bring two of these. They can be in terms of a travel stick. They can be on a CD. Whatever that allows us to play it on a computer is absolutely fine. Now, you're going to bring these with you. Let's pretend that this is one of them. And what you're going to do then is you're going to meet with at least two other people. The three of you outside the training room are going to meet, put it into a computer, and you're going to study it. And you're going to have some worksheets that you will find that are already laid out for you in our manual. And then you're going to fill out whatever you think is the... Um, you're going to use those study guides to determine if it's an individual, what is likely to be the values, beliefs, perceptual filters. If it's two people, fill out forms that will indicate who's likely to dominate. If it's about group dynamics, what is likely to happen next. Now, once you have studied that, you come into the training room and you put your DVD and you project it on a screen. Anyone who's in the room gets to watch it. We're going to see it three times. The first time, we just watch it. The second time, you control the mouse, and you get to determine when you want to pause it and talk about what you have learned by studying it with the study sheets. The third time, I go ahead, and I use the mouse, and I pause it and show you what I see. The difference between what you can see and what I can see is your professional growth. Now, we promise at all times, we will make sure that we stay below the line. We will make sure that we talk about visually what do you see, the building blocks of communication, the audio, voice patterns, speed, tone, pitch. We're also going to talk about kinesthetic in terms of just hand gestures, movement, body posture. And of course, the single most important one is breathing. Got to watch that. Format. We're going to meet five days in a row. You're going to be in groups that you'll rotate what group you're in. You will take your DVD and people will study with you. You'll study with other people. And hour after hour, you will see this is a display of communication. What do we learn from it? How do we recognize what is going on? And you'll be amazed how good you get day after day, always with sensory specific information. We stay below the line, then we give you the label above the line to know how to interpret it. You'll love it. Come. Mission benefits, the format day by day, and just an overview of what we're going to be doing. At this time, if you have any questions, feel free to um, do it in terms of a chat. And what we're going to do is we have one other very, very short two-minute presentation from a movie called Deep Impact. Now, why are we going to show that movie? Well, Deep Impact is a great example of the fact that you can watch people in a scene and you can choose whether you want to look at that scene from a group dynamic standpoint, from a perspective of two of the people, and which one do you think uh, would be more likely to dominate. And then the last one is you can look at each person individually and figure out what their values are. And that's what we're going to be covering in just a little bit. But first, if there's any comments or questions, now's a good time to ask. Toby, feel free to unmute them if you'd like. I can't hear you. I can hear you. Helen, I can hear you if that's okay. you have a question or a comment? No, I don't. I missed the video because I couldn't get it on my device. Oh, this will be put up on uh, YouTube so you'll have access to it. And both okay. Toby and I on our websites will indicate where it is on the YouTube. Okay, great. Thank you. Welcome, Helen. Thanks. Other people, comments or questions? We're going to go to the 
movie Deep Impact. I'm going to try something clever that, uh, if I understand correctly, Toby, this will be a first time for his audience seeing this. We're going to try to play some of this footage, pause it, and then talk about it, and then go back to play some more. It's very, very short. It's 38 seconds is all we have. This movie happens to be a um, science fiction, outer space. We have the person that you're going to see coming up in just a second. He's a Russian. As he comes up the ladder, he is very, very concerned because one of the fellow astronauts has been left outside the capsule and is going to die. His name is Gus. When you listen to him talk, it'll sound like we need to have get out for gas. He's actually talking about the man's name. So we're going to watch him come up the stairs here. And, of course, watch how stressful his eyes are. They have to go get, gas. To go get gas. There's no time for that. Repressurize the cargo bay. He's going to die out there. You can still find him. He has a big... I, I don't have time to argue with you. Just... The second person that comes on the screen, this is the captain. And he is in charge of and has a different level of responsibility than the man in white who just came up. The man that we're looking at, the commander, has to be responsible for the entire crew, not just for the individual. One of the hardest things in terms of group dynamics is when there is a disaster, when we don't have the luxury of time or money or resources, oftentimes there is sacrifice. We will now pick up the movie again and listen to what happens next. Sit down, be quiet. I'm on the fucking locator. Use most of our propellant to get us out of the coma. We can't just leave him. We have to go back. If we go back for Gus, we all die. We can't just leave him in space. In an interaction of all three people, you could look at it from a group dynamic standpoint. You could look at it between any two of those three people, or you could look at each individual and try to figure out what are their values, what are their belief systems. We're going to show you now the captain is going to switch from having raised his voice to going into a whisper and how much more effective it really is. Sit down. Sit down. It's okay. I'm hearing something else. <sighs> And Toby's going to make sure that everyone is muted so that we're only hearing what we have here in the studio plus what we have on the DVD. And, of course, all good music from Hollywood, sorry, all good movies from Hollywood or BBC, they're going to end up having music to increase the drama. Thirty-eight seconds. The amount of information you can learn is unbelievably high in a very short clip of 38 seconds. And that, to me, is what the real thrill is about the second camp. See, most of us, we go through life and we're so time constrained, here's my watch, that we are trying to figure out how do I get as much done as possible. Well, reality comes so fast, you don't have time to really study it. But Perception Camp, because we do footage of live people, or in this case, a movie, you slow it down, you freeze it, you study it. You have all the worksheets in the back of this little packet that will give you the insight into how do you evaluate the individual, two people, or the group dynamics. Now, let's go back and watch it now a little bit different. And Amy, if I turn off the sound, will that allow me to talk without it being an echo? It'll be a, still a distortion in terms of time. Yeah. So I'll need to play it and then stop it. Okay. I'll do that. We have to go get gas. There's no time for that. Repressurize the cargo bay. He's going to die out there. We can still find him. We're going to try to see if we can get it to play, uh, at least on our monitor here 
it didn't indicate that it played, and we'll try it one more time. We have to go get gas. There's no time for that. Repressurize the cargo bay. He's going to die out there. We can still find him. He has a big... I don't have time to argue with you. Just... Stop it, at least on our monitor here. The audio came through, but not the video, and it throws it off in terms of it being a uh, usable um, example of it. Questions and comments that you might have, we're open for another five minutes or so, and then we're going to wrap it up. While you're thinking about any questions you may want to ask, I want to thank you for after a long day at, at your evening, 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock, that you would take the time to join us and see what this perception camp is all about. We're going to have our other dates in terms of our other three perception camps. So our other three webinars. Each webinar that we're going to have, January, February, and in April, we will take each of those separate sections. So January, we're only going to talk about what are all the variables you look at when you're watching an individual in reality or in frozen time called video footage in terms of how do you know what motivates that person. Then the second one we'll have for now will be in February, and that will that's when we're going to cover two people and what are all the variables you consider then. And then in April, we'll be looking at the group dynamics. At least in the past, when we've done this in Australia and we finished it in October, by the time we got to our second of our four webinars, we already had the 20 people filled, the slots. Other people could join us on the webinar, but it's just really nice to have people that are already committed and are looking for the refinements of what they want. Let me finish with a story that uh, to me represents perception isn't new. We've had perception around forever. There's a famous scene in the book called The Republic written by Plato in which in order to represent Plato's description of reality, he ends up having his mentor in life, Socrates, explain to the audience that for most human beings, it's a little bit like sitting in a cave and you're facing one way and behind you, you have this fire and you are tied up in such a way so that you can only look in one direction at this wall. The cave has the fire behind the people, and if people walk, objects walk between the flame and the people, it makes a reflection on the wall, and it is an illusion. It's not really the reality you see. But how do you free yourself? According to Plato, what you do is, through education, sounds very much like Malcolm Gladwell and Blink, you end up having the ability to see what is going on that is real by freeing your hands and looking around and saying, oh, that's not what I was really seeing. It's just reflections, shadows from our fire that is being reflected on the far wall. Toby, if you want to rejoin me, feel free to. I'm here. Thanks. That finishes the first four webinars. Yeah, Mike. I, I was. I just had a quick question about the. Um, obviously, this is from a from a film. So, are these guys and and girls are they trained in perception, or is it just that they're right in the moment? Uh, are they, you know, are they such good actors and actresses that that they actually do the things that we would do naturally? Good question. We we won't know unless we were in the studio. In terms of, there may have been like. 10 takes of that particular scene. So does the director determine which one we're going to see as viewers? Is it perhaps the other nine are on the cut floor of the editing room of some studio somewhere? So we really don't know the intentionality. Who decided to show this? But what we do know is usually a movie is like life in a condensed version so that you can study it with more precision than you could in actual reality. One of the things we found just amazing is you can go to YouTube and you can look at people that are not professional actors and you can look at what they're doing. 
And this is where it gets almost comical because sometimes you're looking at a politician and a politician oftentimes is an actor or is at least trained in how to deliver. Uh, there is several websites that we're going to recommend that you consider, uh, if you would, while you're in camp. And one of the biggest things that we're going to find in terms of those people say, well, you know, that's acting. What about real life? We're going to recommend that everyone that has an iPad bring it because you're going to find that even after you're there two days, you want to film yourself and study yourself instead of someone else. And then you'll actually see everything that we've talked about in terms of individuals, pairs, and groups apply to the people that are actually attending the camp. So we cannot answer. Is it intentional? Would normal people do the same thing? Yes. Would normal people do the same thing as well as actors? No. The big thing that you're going to find is watch the frequency of blinking among actors. It is much less frequent and it is among, among just the everyday people. So these these tells, if you like, that we, I guess we, we all have, they're cross-cultural. It doesn't matter whether you're from Africa or the US or from the UK, it, we, we all do the same things and behave in the same ways and therefore can be read in that way. Is that right? Good question. Uh, historically, that was the question that, if I may, Charles Darwin was interested in. And what he did was, at the time, he sent letters out to as many of the British um, missionaries as possible and said, would you please check and see which facial expressions are universal and which ones are very specific for each culture? And they came back and said, yeah, there was about five to eight that they thought that were universal. And then that debate by, that Charles Darwin started raged on into our century, and actually Margaret Mead came up with the idea of a great anthropologist. No, 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 no. It's based on each culture. So there was a huge debate that was going on exactly with the question you've asked. There was a fellow by the name of Dr. Paul Ekman, E-C-K-M-A-N. He received a grant to study people, and he found one particular group of people that were had never been in contact with what we'd call industrialized educated society. And what he did was he went to this particular village and he had pictures of facial expressions from all over the world. And he would ask them, what would you call that? And it turned out that there is seven basic facial expressions that you can look at from a homo sapiens standpoint. After that, then it tends to be more cultural. Okay, great. So, we, I mean, we could take the skills we learn in perception camp, and it doesn't really matter where we are in the world, we'll still be able to read, if you like, from the tells uh, that are given away. Unless you're trying to make money playing poker in life, yes. <laughs> because when right. you get into poker playing and, and where you uh, want to have a disguise or a mask, then it would not be applicable. So if I may, we're going to be doing what's called normal psychology, not abnormal psychology. So could you use this with a psychopath? No, nope, it would not work. These are all the normal range of functional people. And why wouldn't it work? Just because they're, they would be able to hide these tells? Correct. Right. Correct. There's right. a there's a series of uh, TV shows, one is called In the Actor's Studio, where they take famous people and they interview them. There's another one called Charlie Rose Interviews, and that's when you see the person as a who they are, and it's different than their roles. Uh, different actors, some of, a, some of them have such strong personality that a Robert Redford is going to be Robert Redford in almost any position you put him in. Where you take a Dustin Hoffman, every role he plays, it's a new Dustin Hoffman. So it's just that strength of personality in terms of, will it always be present or won't it? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's like an advanced, uh, in NLP obviously we, we look at eye patterns, we look at calibration, breathing, lip size, etc. It's a, a hugely advanced version of that um, whole and, body. And it, 
And it's based on that too. It's with deep, deep respect of being trained in neurolinguistic programming myself that I was able to figure out how do you watch patterns and how do you figure out what is replicable across cultures. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Toby, you want to announce our next webinar in terms of the date? Yeah, we have um, the next part. You have a slide there, do you, um, Michael, somewhere? Is it your, um, your there we slide? Go. There we go. There, perfect. Yes, yeah, so we've got the 29th, 29th of January. So that's um, the, so could you, could you describe exactly what we'll be looking at there? That's when we're going to take just all of the information that we have been able to gather that says, what do you watch for to indicate what motivates that person? What is their belief system? And Toby, if I may share with the audience how you and I met the very first time, do you mind? Yeah, yeah no, that's okay. <laughs> Go ahead if you'd like. Yeah, we were, um, I was called up at a conference that they, um, it was the NLP conference, how many years ago, Michael, maybe uh, six or seven years ago. and they said is there anyone that is known in the group um, by many others and i think you called four of us up and uh you, i think the first question you asked us to just have a chat about something was that right yes and then each person shared and then what we did was we took each individual and we talked about what their beliefs and values were so that we were doing what we're going to do on january the 29th 29th of january then we took the two people and we paired them up so that we had two people uh, talking in pairs. And then we watched them. I think we probably had 180 people in the audience or so. And they couldn't hear, but they could watch the nonverbals. And then about 40 minutes, 40 seconds into that, we stopped them. And then we talked about who's likely to dominate here, who's likely to dominate here. And we took all four of them and gave them a task. And then we went into group dynamics. So that was a display where people had never met. They came up, they volunteered, and we did all three levels of the perception that we'll do in the camp. That's what you'll have the ability to walk away with at the end of the camp, the 7th through the 11th of May. Yeah. I mean, I, I came off, we were on stage for maybe 10 minutes, and I believed at that time before learning more from you and, and obviously looking forward to perception camp that you you read my mind i thought there was some sort of magic darren brown style stuff going on and i uh, i seriously i walked out thinking he's just got into my mind and read me like a book um so it's that skill that i think that, that excites me you know just being able to do that and to and I didn't say anything to you. You were just able to read my mind. It was just amazing. This is a crystal ball. And if <laughs> I may, I do it to make fun of myself because there are some tricks of not my trade, but someone who does mind reading in which they can take and understand. You can put a little bit of a mirror. And what happens is if you look at this here and not look at the person, the person's facial skin texture is amplified so big on this that you're actually looking at the person and what people of that trade do is they ask you a series of questions, all of them rather artfully vague. However you answer, they watch in terms of your reaction and it's absolutely amplified a whole lot in the crystal ball. And then what they do is then they then go down that pathway on that tangent and then they start mind reading based on your reaction to yourself, it is not them actually reading you. That's different than what we'll learn here. This is an actual set of nonverbals that indicate what's going on. Well, I, I'm not playing poker with you until after perception camp. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> well, the best of the holidays to everyone that joined us. We thank you and encourage other people, if you like, to join on the 29th of January. And again, on our websites, we will post all these dates up, plus each of the webinars will be on YouTube, so you can study them at your leisure. Great. Thank you so much for your time, Michael. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Happy holidays, everyone.